Good evening. Uh, my name is Jack Kuttner. I'm, from, I'm the CEO at Big Belly. Um, what Big Belly is, so I'm going to briefly talk about uh, the company, the product, where we've been, where we're going, and why we find ourselves in a warehouse in New York City talking about the Internet of Things. So Big Belly is, is a cloud application. It's a smart device on the street. It's a garbage can. Is everybody familiar with our product? There's now about a thousand of them in New York City. Yes? No? Yes? One person. All right. Um, ah, very technical. So Big Belly originally was a clean tech play in 2008. Remember what, anybody remember what clean tech is? Before the Internet of Things, uh, clean tech was actually a pretty hot market. You guys are all too young for that, I think. The concept was pretty simple. Um, the gentleman invented the product, came out of the solar, uh, came out of the electric car, car industry. And he basically had the, the idea of using solar power to put compaction capability where it didn't exist before. Compaction has been around forever. What does compaction do? It increases capacity. So cities around the world are collecting public space trash the way they've been collecting it since the Roman Empire. Little tiny cans filled with air. Nobody's packing the garbage down into the can, load up a giant diesel truck, two union laborers, drive around the city, spewing carbon emissions, using up public funds to pick up six and eight pound bags of trash. One of the most inefficient processes that the cities have. So by compacting the trash and reduce the collection frequency, and that was the basic idea behind the product. For the product to be effective, it has to be able to operate in almost any conditions. To operate in any condition, it has to be able to operate without sunlight. A, sol a solar product without sunlight. Why no sunlight? Go downtown to Wall Street, and you'll see most of our stations down there operate in the shade, never see the sun. They're in what we would call an urban canyon. Or go to Stockholm, Sweden in the wintertime, or the rainy season in Seattle. And you need to be able to operate on tiny amounts of energy. Much like the way smartphone technology tries to make the battery last between charges. We had to develop very sophisticated energy management capabilities. So each machine has a fairly sophisticated computer on board with firmware, sensor technology, and the machine is turning itself on and off and doing its thing. Around 2009, it dawned on us that, well, this machine knows an awful lot about what's going on and about its fullness level, etc. If we could share that information with the customer, it would increase the value proposition of the product. So we added wireless capability, basically SMS capability, to each machine, and it now can communicate its status to the customer. To communicate the status, we had to send that data someplace, so we sent the data to a cloud-based server. We didn't know it was a cloud-based server at the time. That was before cloud-based server vernacular had started, but there you are. So you have a smart device on the street. You have Sensing capability, computing cap com computing. Yeah, it died.
Looks good. Thanks. You have computing capability, you have communications capability. So, in effect, you have the Internet of Things. Part of the challenge when you're running a company is to, to recognize what your value proposition is and not kind of get stuck in one way of thinking. So as the Internet of Things started to become the biggest hub out there, we started getting phone calls from places like Hardwire, New York City, um, explaining to us that we were experts in the Internet of Things. So after a while, we stopped arguing with them and, and embraced the mantle. Um, and the reason for that is, is that in the public sector, there are really three applications that everybody points to for the Internet of Things. Parking meters, garbage cans, and street lights. And the garbage cans they were referring to is Big Belly. So we started to think of ourselves as the Internet of Things and we repositioned the company and we dropped the word solar from our name and we became the connected B in our logo. And we started to think about, well, let's look at what we have here. We have a highly sophisticated device that occupies extremely valuable real estate on the sidewalks of major cities around the world. That, that point is important because cities don't want to add more clutter to their sidewalks. So in the public sector, lesson number one for the Internet of Things is be providing an actual core service that they value. So we looked at sensing capability, computing capability, communications capability, our own energy, and said, what else could we do with this? And we began to ask that question. And lo and behold, we found out some interesting things, which we, we categorize really in, in three buckets. I have two of them up here. Public space Wi-Fi, until about six months ago, I didn't realize that it is still a bit of a dilemma for most cities. And when I say most cities, New York City, London, Chicago, pretty much anywhere you go, they are still challenged by how to offer free public space Wi-Fi. Our reaction to that was, how, how could that be? The technology is, is it's old already, right? But what you start to hear is about what they call poles, permits, and power. And what poles, permits, and power is, is exactly that. There's no place to put a router in the public space. There's no way to power it. And there's often a huge contractual and legal and permitting uh, obstacle to getting it done. So uh, the, uh, the business world and the public sector is littered with failed public space Wi-Fi efforts by some pretty big companies. Google comes to mind. Um, and so we looked at our product and said, well, You've, you've already invested in a waste solution. It's on the sidewalk. It has its own power. It has its own location. It doesn't need to be permitted. We kind of looked at it and said, well, this is too easy, too good to be true. If it's too good to be true, it probably isn't. So we've spent the last six to nine months testing this idea that we actually have a unique capability which will expand the value proposition of the product and so far that seems to be the case. We've all heard about big data and we all have heard about urban intelligence. 
Everybody, uh, this is much earlier stage, obviously, than Wi-Fi. People, everybody wants it in the public sector. Nobody knows what they want, exactly. So, the initial list in Dublin was about 30 items. They've narrowed it down to six. But the general suspects are particulate matter, noise, footfall, radiation, weather. Again, a highly protected device when deployed on an enterprise level to collect the trash in an efficient way, provides an infrastructure that allows you to collect data and communicate it to wherever it is that it needs to go. So from relatively uh, simple original uh, product concept of a solar powered compactor, as intelligence and communications have evolved, we now are instead an Internet of Things technology platform designed specifically for public spaces um, and to our knowledge, the only one of its kind. So, the organizers of this event said, don't come here to tell everyone about how great our product is and how great our vision is, um, but rather share some lessons learned. Don't try to sell to the public sector. Lesson number one. <laughs> Uh, we believe we're about to become an overnight success. Of course, we've been at it for the last eight years. Um, most overnight successes take a long time to get there. Um, but we have learned some things, and we have learned how the public sector operates. Uh, and as hard as it is to get in, we believe it's that hard to get back out. So, um, we are we are um, now starting to have conversations because of a value proposition that gets us talking to people other than the guy who picks up the garbage or supervises the park or does basic operating services. Our conversations now are with the Department of Innovation and Technology in New York, with the chief of staff of the mayor, with the policy level people, and we have found that most, New York, most American cities, most cities around the world have extremely bright, motivated, educated people on the policy side of their administrations. These are largely not the people we've been dealing with for the last eight years, but they are the people we're dealing with now because we can basically tell them that we can not only save you money, we can bring you capabilities that you have struggled to figure out how to bring in the name, in the, namely public space Wi-Fi and urban intelligence. But also as the product evolves, we will be able to take control of the Wi-Fi that we are, that network that we're enabling, potentially deliver advertising revenue on a digital basis, uh, back, backlight ad panels on the machine, uh, eventually uh, migrate to actually providing digital screens. Uh, now, what the cities are mostly looking for is ways to generate revenue. City of Chicago just got downgraded to bond status. Mostly under the weight of their pension obligations, the cities are, cities are screaming for ways to save money and the time is coming soon when they're going to have to stop kicking the can down the road. And they're going to have to take some hard measures to address it. So, that's our story. Anybody have any questions? I'm pretty loud. Uh, the, uh, can you explain the power? How is it currently powered? And when you fire up what Wi Fi? What is the power situation there? Because that's, you know, can you repeat the question? Yeah. The uh, question is about power. Um, every one of our stations has a, has a 40 watt panel on it. Um, we currently use, in most locations, 
probably less than the equivalent of what we need from a 15 watt panel. So we are basically harvesting excess energy um, at Mount Wage. We recently completed a, a pilot running routers off of the excess energy harvest on our machine, actually right here in New York. Um, and are now in conversations with the, Mar the Meraki's and the ruckuses of the world talking about, you know, you've built your machine for performance and price, you need to add a third criteria, which is energy. Uh, very easy to fix, they just need to be motivated to do it. And um, we are highly confident that we can provide, uh, if not seven by 24 power for the router, certainly enough, maybe, maybe it will go dark at 2 a.m. Um, we've also got IP now that allows the machines to function as a true mesh network. So if two of the machines are providing coverage that overlaps, they can talk to each other. One will shut down the router while the other machine is powering the coverage. If that machine starts to get low on energy, it will shut down the router and the other machine will turn its router back on. Thanks, it sounds terrific. Uh, you mentioned layering other services on top. Obviously, great idea. Do you have any defined criteria for services that you think are most suitable, most appropriate? For instance, you know, balance between form factor, uh, uh, compensation, uh, service to the public. Just give us an idea. What are you looking for? Uh, well, the, the biggest one, and, and it's become um, really a major area of focus for us, is this Wi-Fi capability. Um, literally everywhere we go. Um, and it's not just streets, parks, the park systems feel, they, it's, the, the general attitude in the public sector now is that there's an act, it's a basic amenity. Just like you, you, if there, you go into a park, there should be a street light. The, the public expectation is, is I should be able to uh, get access to a Wi-Fi network, and it should be free. Um, and so that raises the question of who pays for it. Uh, in here, right in New York, there's an, initi an initiative called City Bridge, uh, or if anybody's familiar with it, uh, Titan, which is an outdoor media company, in conjunction with a whole consortium, is going to be putting Wi-Fi capabilities using the real estate from the old uh, public phone booths. The issue is to use that space, and that's really what was the dif differentiator on their proposal versus other proposals. Um, we're of the humble opinion that they're going to have a lot of problems getting coverage that's ubiquitous enough. And uh, I know of a company who suggested that they have a product that could fill in the gaps. Okay, and so that's a, that's a work in progress. But um, yeah, that, that is the big one. And, and again, if you, talk, if you talk, to, talk to the CIO in Chicago, um, they have an initiative called the Array of Things. It's an Argonne Lab, University of Chicago, and City of Chicago initiative to put sensor arrays throughout the city to collect data. The project is stalled. Not a technology problem. Where do we hang this stupid array of sensors? Well, the guy running the project now thinks they belong inside the big belly. That's the big, we have 400 stations in the inner, in the inner loop in Chicago. Um, and, and, and again, we've done, uh, we've done analysis on total cost of ownership uh, of, of what the alternatives are. Um, and the, you know, by the time you're done negotiating with the landlord to hang a sensor array or hang a router off the side of his building, he, sell, he sells the building. You've got to negotiate with the tenant. It's an, an ongoing battle. Getting into light posts, very expensive, highly regulated, depending on the city. So. All right, wonderful. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much. You're welcome.